All right, listeners, I think you know that we are part of the Radiotopia Network, which is basically a network built on the idea that you should support the most creative, independent audio makers around. No one, and I mean no one, embodies the Radiotopia ethos more than Benjamin Walker and his show, Theory of Everything. Benjamin, who I've known for a long time, has been making beautiful, personal, sprawling audio documentaries for decades that help us understand the very strange world we live in. And now he has a new series called Not All Propaganda is Art. The new series goes back to the 1950s, when Western security agencies like the CIA paid artists, writers, and intellectuals to fight the cultural Cold War. The CIA funds were free. I mean, no one was told what to say. Gloria Steinem, activist who sees the CIA as a sort of enlightened pal or rich uncle, there is another viewpoint. Look, if you're listening to this show, I know you like secret histories. I know you like a mix of culture and politics and shadowy figures. So what are you waiting for? Not all propaganda is art from Benjamin Walker. You can find it now wherever you listen or at theoryofeverythingpodcast.com. This episode is brought to you by Progressive, home of the Name Your Price tool. You say how much you want to pay for car insurance, and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. It's easy to start a quote. Visit Progressive.com to get started. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, October 21st, 1978, you walk into your local corner store, your gas station, your bodega, whatever you want to call it, hoping to pick up a case of your favorite beer that is named after a president's brother. And guess what? The shelves are empty. What a tragedy. You're going to have to turn to something else at a similar price point, maybe High Life or Coors or, God forbid, Rolling Rock, my least favorite beer. (laughs) Um, What I am referring to here is the glorious period of time from November 19th. 1977 to October 1978, when you could in fact find yourself drinking Billy Beer, which was named for and endorsed by the younger brother of President Jimmy Carter, Billy Carter. This episode was suggested to us by listener Killian, who writes, quote, I was wondering if you might consider doing an episode about Jimmy's deadbeat brother, Billy and Billy (laughs) Beer. I find Billy Carter such a hilarious figure, arguably politically significant in how he shaped perceptions of his brother. So there are bigger Mm -hmm. themes here beyond just this novelty beer. But thank you, Killian. And here we are. Let's talk about Billy Beer, which ceased production in October 1978. That is our hook. Here, as always, are Nicole Hammer of Columbia and Kelly Carter Jackson of Wellesley. Hello there. Hello, Jody. Hey there. Uh, let's do it right off the bat. Favorite cheap beer and least favorite cheap beer. Any nominations? Oh, that's mm. a good question. I <laughs> am not a huge fan of Miller Lite. I think okay. it's a little, mm. little watery. Um, mm. And favorite cheap beer. I don't think I have a favorite cheap beer. I, okay. I came to beer during the IPA um, uh, era, yes. which is sort of categorically no cheap beers in that category. I'm going to say I'm not a big beer drinker. Okay. I would definitely put Miller Lite as something that I would not drink. Okay. Um, but if I do, I like a blue moon, you know. But um, but I don't know. I'm a seltzer water girl through and through. Like, that's all I like. So you might like Miller Lite. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> Carbonated uh, water. Yeah, exactly. They're not that different. Um, and from what we can tell, Billy Beer is sort of basically one of those beers that taste like water that maybe has gone a little bad um you know and we can get into a little bit of that but let's let's take i will say you know i like pbr i like just straight up not bud light just bud regular bud i'm a fan of that heavy bud heavy and it has been a little hard as we've researched this to find out exactly what the tasting notes of billy beer were but i think we can paint a picture of the sort of market and the and the um palette that it was going for but let's take half a step back and just talk about Billy Carter and sort of what role he played before he decided to endorse a cheap beer. Um, Black sheep, deadbeat. These are words that feel like... Alcoholic. Well, alcoholic, (laughs) yes. I mean, there's a lot of things that he does that are just um, downright embarrassing. And 
Um, but some people might call a little redneckish. I mean, I think I think it's funny that you know they're they're sort of like the stereotypical like Jimmy and Billy. Like those are classic Southern peanut farmer names from Georgia, <laughs> and it mm-hmm. just seems like you know. I think that uh, Jimmy Carter has always sort of represented it this very um, almost like statesman like iconish type person in his maybe in his post presidency life. I think of him that way. I think of him as like the classic grandpa and Sunday school teacher. But right. to have his his brother, you know, kind of a sloppy and a little bit of a uncouth, I think is is an interesting optics for sure. <laughs> and, and it's important to note that. Billy Carter embraces this idea that he's a redneck. Mm-hmm. Like he wears shirts yeah. that say like redneck lobbyist. Um, he <laughs> He's putting on a character that might very well be based on who he is in real life, but he's doing yeah. things that he obviously has control over. Like he pees on the runway in front of all of the press when he's getting ready to go on a flight. And he is constantly playing up this Tim Allen side of his personality uh, (laughs) where he's just he's in it for the press attention and looking for ways to Mm. market that press attention and looking for ways to market his connections to his much more famous and much more powerful Mm -hmm. older brother. I mean, he's somebody who has tried all of these different businesses and he keeps failing at them. Um, And meanwhile, his brother has had you know the greatest success in the world, um, Mm -hmm. which is becoming president of the United States. In part two, because of his southernness and his yeah. folksy Clean cut. peanut farmer yeah. thing. Right, right. Yeah. Um, you might be a redneck if you pee on the runway in front of the press <laughs> and then are, are photographed wearing a shirt that says redneck power. Um, yes. But, yeah. <laughs> but I, and I do like, I, I don't know what I make of the word redneck, but you know, I don't use it that much. But, but I will say in 1979, the Associated Press did describe Billy as a quote, professional redneck, which I just love. I love, 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 love that phrase. And I think it sums up so much of him. And yeah, if you look at photos of him, he's got, you know, these big Coke bottle glasses and these big sideburns and this big sort of beer belly. And um, yeah, he's just the, he's the sort of like um, the Chris Farley to Mm -hmm. the David Spade and whatever that movie is or a number of those movies that they made, you know, but I think that's sort of the the dynamic um, that you have going here. And let's get, we'll get to the beer in a second, but I mean, there is you know, and I think our, our listener, Killian, referred to this, but there is a sort of political element here to it. And it does get to, as you were saying, Nikki, that Carter is walking this sort of like folksy, down-home, southern charm, whatever. But obviously he also needs to play in sort of more effete, elite democratic circles. And so like he's walking this line. And I do think um, Billy Carter kind of like ends up shaping – Maybe just because he's a sort of sideshow, press sideshow, but he ends up shaping a lot of people's perceptions of Jimmy Carter, who, as listeners know on this podcast, we only talk about in in the context of like, oh, poor Jimmy Carter. These like sort of (laughs) sad sack things keep happening to him. And, you know, his younger brother's uh, behavior is one that seems to be in line with a lot of those other things, too. Yeah, it's a kind of double edged sword because on the mm-hmm. one in the one sense he connects Jimmy Carter to these very legitimate and authentic blue collar rural roots, right? You see a picture of the two of them sitting together on kind of like recliners eating fried yeah. chicken, and suddenly mm-hmm. you look at Jimmy Carter and you're like, Oh, that's who he is, right? He's that <laughs> guy who, who, who feels really comfortable in that situation. Yes. But at the same time, he's not authentically Billy, right? Billy is Mm -hmm. the rough side of things. Carter is talking about how, um, you know, he's lusted after women in his heart. And that is a way of like showing he was a Sunday school teacher, right? He's so (laughs) clean cut. And um, Billy Carter is kind of like his his id out there, um, which which cuts a contrast. And when you think about the need to reach out to the you know, it was in the 1970s called the hard hat, uh, in the 1980s, the white working class Reagan Democrat. Mm-hmm. Billy was more in line, I think, culturally with them than Carter was. Is either of your sense that the Carter camp tries to exploit Billy's sort of authenticness or whatever? Um, I mean, mm-hmm. it does seem like it's it's really mostly just like sideshow, keep it slightly arm's length kind of. Yeah, I think a lot of the 
the Carter team was like, real your brother in. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, like there is this real desire to sort of present the presidential family in a particular way. And I think that Billy becomes a, a distraction. And I, I definitely think, you know, in a current context, we might raise a lot of at least ethical questions about how he's trying to use his brother's <laughs> presidency to market, you know, certain things or sell certain things yeah. that could come into a real issue when it comes into uh, money, whenever you're mixing money and politics in that way. And it gets it gets into some really serious ethical stuff a little later. But let's do the beer and then we'll do the other sort yeah. of deeper stuff. Um, but a beer company comes up with this plan like, hey, you know, this is a sort of notable character he's known for you know uh rough and rowdy ways he probably likes uh, drinking a lot of beer let's come up with a beer and market it around him and so in the fall of 77 the louisville based fall city brewing company which is like a pretty successful brewing company decides to market billy beer and i'm going to read the marketing language around it it says quote brewed expressly for and with the personal approval of one of america's all-time great beer drinkers billy carter and then the billy Carter quote that appeared on the packaging is I had this beer brewed up just for me. I think it's the best I ever tasted and I've tasted a lot. I think you'll I think you'll like it too. That is good. That is good marketing language and it appears to have worked. Charming alcoholism. Yes. Well, it that's is totally yeah. the alliteration of saying like brewed Billy beer. Yeah. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. All you need is a good name. Just, yeah. A Billy beer. I mean, it's it's kind of perfect. It sort of reminds me of like, what was that beer they drink on The Simpsons? Like, um, well, Duff. 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 Yes. Duff beer. It well, kind of reminds me of like that. There's a number of Simpsons tie ins here, which I'm saving for a second. <laughs> I will, I, I've, I've done my research. But, um, but before but, we uh, get to that. No, no. But, but, but yes. And it is catchy it has like this big red logo bold font uh they do a massive marketing campaign and at least for eight months it seems to really work yeah i mean you're talking about a like you were saying a a successful brewing company there is a world in which this becomes a great beer right they work on the formula they have this branding which gets people who normally might not buy their beers to buy their beers they team up with all of these other brewing companies to make sure they have enough billy beer to meet demand they can millions if not a billion um, cans of billy beer and they're Mm. a hot commodity i mean the 1970s is known for its fads and its collectibles this Mm -hmm. is kind of the the pet rock of brewing. Hmm. <laughs> and it also hits this this like interesting cultural thing, which is still very relevant today, which is you have people buying it earnestly and then you have people buying it ironically and mm-hmm. you have people buying it like hate hate buying it. Right. And so you have <laughs> opponents of Carter um, going out to buy it as a novelty item, but you sort of hit all three sort of motivations, um, yeah. which, you know, I'm channeling Donnie Deutsch here or something like my marketing, <laughs> whatever. But that, that feels like, um, you know, it feels like a successful formula when you get lots of people buying it for different reasons. Initially, yes, but that's not sustainable, right? Well, like <laughs> once once the niche or the, the newness of it or the, the fad, the trend of it wears off, you still have to have a customer base that wants to buy it because they enjoy drinking it. Like, that's essential. What, what Kelly is getting at here is that this was successful until people actually opened the can and drank the beer. <laughs> yeah, it turns out they might not have nailed the formula. They might have rushed forward with the concept and the ad copy and not tinkered with the uh, the recipe well enough. Because everyone who drank this beer, including... Billy Carter himself, mm-hmm. like this is not drinkable. This this is swill. <laughs> yeah, like rumors start to come out that Billy is is actually when he drinks on his own, he's drinking PBR, which I think <laughs> just tells you a little bit, like on the power rankings. Like if you're if you're actively rushing away from this beer and and into the welcoming arms of Pabst Blue Ribbon, um, I think it tells you a little bit about <laughs> what this beer tastes like. <laughs> Nothing worse than badly brewed Billy beer. <laughs> there you go. Wow. Nothing and it turns worse. out that it's all 
badly brewed. Are you going to do the baboon bicycling backwards by the end of this? <laughs> I, Brewing Billy Beer? The bees, but oh. <laughs> I couldn't resist. So, so look, we get to uh, October 1978. They cease production because it is just, you know, it's like this big push in the fall of 77 through the spring. And then by the summer, it's clear of 78. It's clear, you know, we're not going to be able to sell this thing. A v- interesting thing happens, which is, as you were saying, Nikki, it has this like novelty appeal to it and so when it goes out of production a bunch of people snap them up because they feel like oh this is a novelty item this is gonna be a collector's item and people try and like run up the prices and sell it for a lot but that doesn't work because there's a ton of this stuff floating around and you don't (laughs) there isn't scarcity there's actually just billy beer everywhere and no one wants it and so that's not really a recipe for um collectibles Mm. you need that rarity Somebody tries to sell it for $1,000 in an ad in, like, the New York Times or something. And then a a week or two later, there's an ad from the same person offering it for $200. And I suspect that person did not get paid for either one of those. No. So, um, The Simpsons. No surprise, The Simpsons, you know, many of their jokes, especially around Homer, are based on these sort of like 70s kitschy novelty yes. nostalgia. So there have been a couple moments that The Simpsons have touched on Billy Beer. Um, really? Yes. So in one episode, Homer puts on an old concert jacket that he wore when he was like in high school in the 70s and he finds a can of Billy Beer in the pocket <laughs> and he drinks it. Uh, and then this is a, a phenomenal moment. And I will say... a. A joke that I didn't really get, you know, I, I remember it from watching The Simpsons, but a joke that I didn't really get until I sort of started to get my head around this. But Homer, again, finds an old can of Billy beer. He cracks it. He drinks it. And then at the, after he finishes drinking it, he goes, we elected the wrong Carter. Which <laughs> 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 is so good. <laughs> Billy Homer, for president? Yep, yep. <laughs> that Homer Simpson would love a, you know, decades old can oh, of, a two decade old can of Billy Beer. Um, but yeah, those are some good Simpsons references. Well, and then I. Simpsons to give us nuggets about. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> little Easter eggs about the, the future. We get letters all the time from folks saying, you know, there's a Simpsons reference to this thing you did. I mean, The Simpsons is full of, no surprise, mm-hmm. but we could probably build this whole show just around Simpsons references. Or maybe in our research, we should just see if The Simpsons touched on it. Because like, I feel like half the stuff we do, The Simpsons have made some joke about it over the years. Um, and I agree. I also think the like aesthetic of the duff, I couldn't find mm-hmm. an actual connection. But I think that aesthetic is, has to have been based on Billy Beer because it's just this big, bold mm-hmm. lettering. Um, so Billy Carter, he's scheming. He's a sort of sideshow. He has this failed beer venture. Before we move on, I, I do want to point out like he was... I think struggled with alcoholism and I think in the modern context we would have an actual conversation around that and people mm-hmm. would say like well you know doing a beer endorsement around this guy is probably not a not good very, idea not a good idea not very tactful so his heavy drinking and his like unstable behavior was seen exclusively as a sideshow from what we can mm-hmm. tell no one was really asking deeper questions there it is worth noting mm-hmm. that um His behavior does get a little more complicated and problematic as the years go on, including towards the end of the Carter presidency. And this is the one that landed Billy Carter on the cover of Time magazine, where they said that the Carter presidency had to cope with Billy. Uh, But we have something called Billygate, which involves Libya. So this is why I was saying earlier that it felt like his redneck personality was kind of a put on Mm. because he is traveling during the Carter administration to Libya. He takes out a sizable loan from their government and is lobbying Mm. on their behalf. He's he's a a registered foreign lobbyist um, for the country of Libya because of his connections to Jimmy Carter. And this, of course, Mm. becomes a big scandal, not unlike ones that we hear associated with other presidencies where the black sheep of the family gets entangled in um, international dealings. But Billy Billy Carter was the one who was doing some pioneering in this area. Mm. Which is crazy to me that, again, we think about these presidential families and I guess don't always consider how siblings might be on the come up using or not just siblings, but children, spouses, you know, parents, maybe like, I mean, it really is such a major platform. If, 
if held in unethical hands, I think people have the capacity to do a lot of stuff with that influence. And especially when there's money to be made, you know, his brother doesn't make a whole lot of money off of the beer. I think he licensed his name for like $50,000. But I also think it's interesting, too, because at this time, like President Carter is not a wealthy president Mm -mm. you know like he talks about how when he left the white house he was essentially broke it's not until presidents go and write their memoirs and their books that they start to get you know all of this these major um royalties and things of that nature but it does go to show you that like the presidency doesn't always equal prosperity um and i think that's something worth considering Yeah, and that there are often family members trying to cash in. This story Mm -hmm. reminds me of nothing more than Roger Clinton, who was Bill Clinton's, I think his half-brother, who was constantly trying to find ways. He was um, nicknamed Headache by the Secret Service. That was his code name (laughs) because he was such a pain in the ass. Um, But by the end of the presidency, he is like working for family of mobsters um, trying to get a um, a pardon for Rosario Gambino and just all sorts of questionable dealings during the Clinton administration as he tries to get rich off his his new connection. Mm. And of course, we see that with kids of presidents as well, too. I mean, there's Mm -hmm. the Trumps, right, who had, you know, we don't have to, (laughs) the most blurred lines (laughs) possible there. And then, you know, even Hunter Biden Biden. is clearly Mm -hmm. like, you know, and so, yes, there's always an angle to be worked. And I would say if you're Mm -hmm. close to power, then and you're unscrupulous Um, or, you know, frankly, if there's a little bit of that sibling element of like, oh, my you know, my older brother made it or my younger brother made it. And now I, mm-hmm. you know, if there's probably some interesting <laughs> dynamics there. And so now I'm going to get mine. Um, mm. You know, I will also say, I, I, I sort of half believe what I'm about to say, but it does, <laughs> but some of this does make me think a little bit about like, it is also very important. We've talked about this presidents and people in power to have like people they trust people they know Mm -hmm. people who are going to give it to them straight you see why i think a lot of times presidents retreat to their old friends the ones who knew them before they were powerful Mm -hmm. and famous and so i can see why siblings are kept in the inner circle for that and i can see frankly how it could work well and i mean for instance i guess it's not a sibling scenario here but you know bo biden was clearly so important to joe biden as Mm -hmm. a son um and a friend but also a counselor until he died um and so I think there's a way for this dynamic to maybe be advantageous, but it is fraught, clearly. Yeah. Um, I mean, think about Bobby mm-hmm. Kennedy, right? right. Yeah. A close yeah. personal yeah. advisor to John Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think we've covered Billy pretty well. It is worth noting that in 2010, the brand Billy Beer was sort of brought back um, in the independent craft brewery f- craze. And uh, I think don't know if it is still being made but i know that in the 2010s billy beer was you know sort of back for a bit as a as a craft brew but um i suppose it's probably now actually a collectible item i haven't gone on ebay and and checked um i think can i just say the funniest part of this whole thing is when billy carter later joked that the reason he quit drinking was because of (laughs) billy beer and how badly it tasted (laughs) amazing amazing um that gave me a chance, by the way, to go on eBay. It is still very cheap. <laughs> no, <laughs> you can buy you can buy, uh, you can buy a six packs for fifteen bucks right now. Uh, on uh, uh, so yeah, something um, for the although, holiday party. Although, all of these look like no, yeah, you can buy a six pack pre owned, which I think means someone drank it for fifteen twenty bucks. But then you can buy a single can, which looks like it's been unopened for ten seventy five. So yeah, still a still collector can. Oh yep. god. Yeah. Um, how about this? If one of you listening right now wants to go on eBay and buy <laughs> some Billy beer and try it, and you pledge to try it, I will reimburse you. I will reimburse you the cost of eBay and shipping. I will not reimburse you the hospital bill. Uh, but uh, you get in touch with me, and I'll Venmo you the fifteen twenty bucks it cost, and then you can report back oh, to us man. and what it tasted like. And I'm buying it I'm right now. With my- yeah, I'm sticking with my seltzer water. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, that brings us to the end of the episode. Uh, Nicole Hammer, thanks to you. Thank you, Jody. And Kelly Carter Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. I'm square with the damn IRS. <laughs> so you don't owe them anything? No, owe them anything right now. Until <laughs> next year. Until next year, that's right. <laughs> you can either try to live a normal life like I did or either lock yourself in a closet, which I would say try to live a normal life and the hell with the press.
Support for this day in esoteric political history comes from Odoo. If you feel like you're wasting time and money with your current business software or just want to know what you could be missing, then you'll need to join the millions of others who have switched to Odoo. Odoo is the affordable all-in-one management software with a library of fully integrated business applications that help you get more done in less time for a fraction of the price. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash this day. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash this day. This day, Odoo, modern management made simple. Radiotopia. From P. 